Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon here in the East Coast and Central Time Zones. Uh, and uh, good morning to those who are joining uh, from further uh, west. We're very excited to share with you today uh, Simbox, which uh, we feel is a solution to a lot of the barriers that come up as EMS educators for bringing pediatric high quality simulation to, uh, to every EMS agency. Um, and we brought some poll questions with us that um, will address, um, will address some of the barriers and perhaps some ways to overcome those barriers that Simbox offers. We'll move forward to the next slide. And I'm going to uh, just ask that, you know, we've got a pretty nice group here and a good number of people. I'm gonna ask that folks write their name, their organization, and um, if you've ever done a simulation before in the chat. And also with the organization piece, if I can add just one more thing, please let us know what state what territory, or if you're from further afar, what country you're joining us from. Uh, I was excited to hear that a colleague from the Cayman Islands will be joining us today. Um, thank you, uh, Sherry, for getting us started there. Uh, or for Sherry. We can move on to the next slide, and uh, this will get us into some of the meat of what we've been uh, putting together for you here today. Uh, our objectives are going to be to explore what resources Simbox is, what is Simbox, and then how do we use it? What are the steps, the process to conduct a simulation using it? And then uh, we're going to go so far as to offer up a challenge or some homework or something to take back to your state, to your region, to your agency that involves uh, Simbox. So, uh, I, I'm going to introduce just this idea of what is Simbox really quickly, which is at the time that Simbox was developed uh, some years ago now, we were at the forefront of the meal in a box concept where various, uh, various food suppliers would supply the recipe and the ingredients that were necessary to make a delicious meal. And they could help someone who wasn't a really effective chef like me make something quick for the family, relatively quick that tasted good. Likewise, in a higher stakes way, what Simbox lets us do is take the ingredients for high quality simulation, the instructions for making it happen to produce some high quality education for our, um, for our learners, for our EMS clinicians in the field. So that's what Simbox is in a box, in a kit, a way to offer simulation for uh, pediatric training for EMS. Rio, if you'd be so kind to pull up our uh, poll questions. And um, first, I'd like to ask you all um, to vote on this, uh, this pop-up that says, does your organization routinely use EMS simulation? Uh, just yes or no. We'll hold that up there for just a few seconds and encourage folks to, uh, to respond. And uh, I'll give it just five more seconds. And uh, thank you for responding in the chat as well. Uh, I see that uh, you know that a good number, about three out of four uh, EMS organizations represented on our call, which is the National Association of EMS Educators, use simulation. And there's an opportunity uh, to bring on another quarter uh, of, of folks, or also to use this if you already have an established sim program. This can be a great fit for expanding your pediatric. Um, training or to use a lower uh, resource intensity, high frequency simulation for pediatrics if you so choose. We can take a look at the next uh, poll question if you'd be so kind, Rio. Um, how does your team use simulation? And you can choose any of, um, of these five boxes, or I suppose if it's all of the above, you could choose all of the above. Uh, education, where some EMS agencies um, use it really to help gain new skills and knowledge, to hone skills and knowledge, to um, refresh learning, and sometimes for just-in-time training before an anticipated event like, let's say, summertime and heat injury. Uh, and in a group that represents the National Association of EMS Educators, we see that education is really well uh, represented. We also see that folks use it for clinical evaluation. It's a way to see what gaps there may be between actual and ideal care for children or any patient in the pre-hospital setting. And it can be used for equipment training and that uh, quite a few uh, users say that they use it for all of the above. 
systems testing, like communication, handoffs, handoffs between EMS clinicians or from EMS to the field um, is uh, perhaps the least, uh, least used among our respondents here. Okay, thank you for that, Ria. And uh, we can move on to the next slide. Or, or yeah, why not? We can go on, um, you know, uh, actually the next slide and we'll bring up the last of the questions it fits really well with, um, with our next slide after this one. So why simulation? What we often hear from EMS clinicians is that children represent uh, a low frequency population, maybe one out of 10 or fewer of, of the EMS patient population. And then among those children, that um, those children who are critically ill or injured are the vast minority of the children that EMS clinicians see. So simulation helps us bridge that gap uh, and helps us um, ensure that EMS clinicians have the skills, knowledge, and the savvy with equipment to be ready to care for children in critical situations. Um, simulation allows us to take our knowledge and put it into action to use decision-making, teamwork and effectiveness and communication. And it's an opportunity for a team to train together in a realistic setting. That setting could be an EMS training facility. It could be training that's done in the back of the ambulance. And that is a great place to do Simbox. And it also is freedom to make mistakes. If we're using a mannequin and then augmenting that with some screen-based information about that mannequin, that mannequin is not going to be harmed. And it allows us to make mistakes and be ready uh, when there's a real patient in front of us. <clears throat> we can move on to the next slide, please. All right, so there's a lot of barriers to education, and this is a group that could certainly share uh, what the barriers to EMS education are. They include cost. If our clinicians uh, are uh, paid, professionals as opposed to volunteer professionals, um, there may be some costs associated with their time to bring them in for training. Uh, it can be expensive, uh, you know, it can be expensive to, um, to bring people together. Frequency and sustainability can be an issue. Uh, the need for, quote, specialists for people who are trained to do simulation. And also sim uh, simulation can be a bit of a uh, of a judgy uh, uh, situation if it's not done in a safe space. I'm gonna pause and I appreciate your feedback, Anthony, in the chat. I missed your last name uh, and I appreciate that this. I'm gonna say it one more time and I'm gonna try to um, be a little more clear with my language about Simbox is. Simbox is a low resource uh, tool for doing simulation. It involves some pre-printed resources that can be accessed either on a screen or printed out ahead of time to help with doing the simulation and then debriefing the team. It's also a video that's available online that depicts what's going on for the patient and the patient's vital signs. The next component of it is a low uh, fidelity mannequin. Great, thank you so much. Here's the what is sim box. <laughs> we see a depiction of what's on the screen. We see um, we see the mannequin and we see the crucial ingredient, which is the EMS clinicians who are the learners. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you're more alone, Anthony. Uh, I, I want to be clear that it's more than just a meal in a box. It's, uh, mm -hmm. It is a way to do simulation in a way that takes us away from having to go to a medical school simulation center or having to have a, a pediatric emergency physician or other uh, physician come and do the simulations. We think there's still value in having us come. Uh, we hope you see that value too, but it's a way for an EMS educator, a pediatric champion, a pediatric emergency care coordinator to do pediatric training uh, on a more regular basis and improve the skills, self-efficacy, and knowledge of EMS clinicians when it comes time to take care of children in the back of an ambulance and also in the field. Um, why don't we pull up our third and final of the polling questions, which um, helps us uh, explore some of the barriers that we just discussed. So, um, you know, you can choose uh, as many of these as apply for your uh, agency or group. What barriers are there to using simulation more often? Um, you know, why is it that simulation, um, you know, is used for 75% of respondents, but maybe perhaps not used as often as it could be, or you prefer to use it? Which of these barriers apply?
All right. We'll give just a couple more seconds. Um, and also, um, I'll say one more thing before we take a look at the poll results. Another great thing about Simbox is, although we've presented it so far, is something that requires everyone to be in the same room. There are ways to do it that help overcome barrier number three, which Dr. Athanas Polo will, um, will present to us that Simbox can be done remotely and still have a high quality simulation experience. Rio, if you'd be so kind, we can take a look at our uh, results. Great. Uh, your responses mirror what others have told us too, that there is often a perception that you know, we need the highest fidelity mannequin that we can get our hands on. And uh, these things are a large capital expense. Meanwhile, the mannequin that you see depicted here, which I have no commercial interest in, um, costs about $125 to obtain, as opposed to add two zeros to, uh, for a, a state-of-the-art pediatric mannequin. Instructor training, absolutely. Having an instructor who feels comfortable with the pediatric content and also delivering simulation can be a real barrier getting learners together in the same place. Sure, one thing that I've learned in working with folks in EMS is the schedule is always in flux. Um, and getting people together, even with the best of intentions, can be very difficult. And then learner reluctance, the feeling of being on the spot and uh, you know that uh, people are performing in front of their peers. So Simbox attempts to address all of these issues as well. Uh, so that is an introduction to Simbox and um, the barriers that come to simulation, what it is that we're trying to achieve with Simbox. And now uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Athanasa Polo, to really show us what the components of Simbox are and what, uh, what it offers. And I'll, I'll be monitoring the chat as well. Thanks, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Cicero. And hi to everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is Sophia. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine fellow, and I've been leading the Simbox team for the last two and a half years. And I I created these um, cases that we're going to talk about um, with feedback from both emergency medicine colleagues and um, colleagues who work in the pre-hospital setting. Um, this is a that's a map from our website. Um, in the past, it's quite humbling, but in the past year, Simbox was used in over 79 countries for over 5,000 sessions. Um, and I think what's what's really um, important for me for, for this is that this, it shows that this is a tool that can be used in all sorts of resources and in, in places with very different levels of resources. So um, as Dr. Sister said, Simbox is a, is a free and will remain a free or, um, open access online resource that anybody can use to do high quality simulate pediatric training and simulations in their own environment. And the whole point of this is to kind of take, take um, the need away from having expensive equipment or specialists in simulation or specialists in pediatrics and give the knowledge and the power to local, to local educators and EMS providers to take this and run it and practice with their own teams. So these are the um, eight cases that we've already created. Um, there is a newborn delivery, resuscitation, a pediatric burn, spoiler alert, that's a, a, um, a non-accidental trauma case, that's a, a, ca a case with a SVT, uh, shock, seizures, so a wide variety of pediatric emergencies. So each case is made up of two basic elements. The first one is a booklet, and the booklet has everything you might need to run this simulation on your own, without myself, without anybody else in your own environment. But it has everything you need to, to go for it. And then the video is um, a video that we have on YouTube that you can also download and, and use it if you don't have internet access. And the video has the most important part of the video is that it has a video of either an actual patient who is either seizing or having difficulty breathing or is unresponsive or doing whatever they're doing. Um, and next to that, there's a, a pre-recorded video of vital signs. So essentially those two correspond to each other. So initially the, when the patient is um, unresponsive, they might be hypoxic. 
later on they might be more responsive and their heart the vital signs might be better so you use this video you you have your laptop and you stream this video next to when the the actual scene is taking place and the the participants refer to the video to have their answers their uh, their questions answered that's an example of a video that we have uh, please it's a little bit horrifying to look but um here's um the way you the way this works is that you have your actual participants having a mannequin or whatever they use. Like I've had, we've run simulations with stuffed animals uh, as mannequins or like with a pillow as an actual mannequin. And then at the bedside, as the facilitator, you stream this video and this video shows an actual patient and their vital signs. Um, and then as the video pr pr progresses, the both the video of the patient and the vital signs change. So when your team asks you, oh, Sophia, what's what's my patient's airway? What's my patient's blood pressure? What's my patient's heart rate? You um, point towards the video and um, it offers a lot of a lot of information in a very realistic and direct way rather than you saying, oh, the patient's having retractions, the patient's having nasal flaring. Um, any any questions so far? And I'll talk in detail about both the video and the booklet. All right, I guess that's no questions. So um, again, the booklet, it can be a little bit overwhelming because it really has a lot of information and you can use as many of that as you want. Um, the, it has a case progression. So that's the, the case that we have with um, a patient who sustained very extensive uh, scald burns. So for the case progression, you have the vital signs for the case, you have facilitator prompts, examination fund findings, and participant actions. So you can refer to that as the case progresses to have some direction about what's gonna happen with, with your case. Um, let me see. Oh, thank you, Dr. Sister, for answering these questions. Um, yes, um, there is tons and please feel free to stop or um, interrupt at any point. I want this to make sense for you. So there's anything you wanna ask or clarify, please, please um, stop me. So the booklet has a lot of, a lot of information. So for this burn patient, um, I made these flashcards that you can print and, and have at the bedside for your own reference. You can screenshot them on your phone and it really often offers all the information you might need for pediatric burn management in just two pages. There's a lot of teaching content. For example, how do you classify the burn severity? How are burns in children different than adults? So a lot of information to help you be empowered to teach others and, and, and talk about pediatric resuscitations. And then um, honestly, there's a lot of information um, educational goals or my or checklist that you want to you can set before you start the session like what's my goal what I, what do I want my learners to take away from this session I want them to learn how to perform an efficient primary and secondary survey I want them to estimate the percentage of total body surface burn so these are some sample goals that you can send for the session for your session but you can make your own educational goals and then a lot a lot of other pediatric specific information. Um, and then, as I said, the booklet, you ideally you review this in advance before you run your simulation so that you have all the information ready. You can print and have it at the bedside. Or if you want, um, if you want to run a simulation on the go, you can go through this with your learners at the same time. So that is the um, that's the booklet. And the booklet is available online. You can download it. I'm sorry. You can download this um, and have it um, with you. You can print it. You can access it online. Um, yeah, that's the booklet. Any questions about the booklet? Sophia, well, people uh, perhaps share their questions. One of the things that I think is really strong about the resources you've developed is uh, it can be tailored by the facilitator, by the EMS educator on the fly. Um, you know, you see in the um, in the screenshots of the booklet a number of different objectives. Um, if someone wants to pull out just four or five for the simulation and focus on those, 
uh, perhaps it's based on a patient that was just cared for by the agency and people recognize that there are opportunities for improvement. Uh, just pulling out a few of these um, objectives can make sense. If it's being done as education, uh, then perhaps all of the pieces are included. And uh, Lindsay, I see your, um, uh, your question. I'll put the, uh, the website in the chat, uh, but certainly open to your questions about the booklet. Yeah, so you can, Dominic, thank you, thank you for your question. You can, you can do whatever you want. Um, another thing that, I, that I've heard actually from EMS colleagues is that sometimes they want to share the entire booklet with their learners in advance before the same. So one of our sims is, um, is a, newborn, um, a newborn resuscitation. So the baby's being delivered and the team has to resuscitate that. And we'll talk more about the neonatal resuscitation protocol. And it's obviously super stressful. And your, our goal and your goal as a facilitator is you want people to succeed. And you don't want people to be a part of the simulation and like feel bad about, oh, that if somebody doesn't remember the neonatal resuscitation protocol. So if you want, you can, you can share all of this with your learners in advance, like before the session and say, you know what, we're going to talk about a newborn delivery and resuscitation. Have a look at this free open access resource in advance, remind yourself, and then in real life, we're going to practice on this and, and you know, set ourselves up for success. Another thing, like you can print them, mm -hmm. If you want, you can print these flashcards. I've, I usually print, especially the burn flashcards, the burn pages. I print many copy of them and I get, hand it out to people um, during the session so that they have something with them um, when they, during the session and afterwards. So this is, you can share as much as this as you want to everybody. Um, and the goal is not, the goal is to, yeah, the goal is to share the knowledge and and set everyone up, um, be, make people feel better prepared the next time they have a sick child, whatever works. Um, yeah. All right. Um, awesome. And let's move to um, how to set up the room. So um, as we elaborated a few times, you really, the goal of this is to, for you to, to, to need the minimum amount of resources to run this. So you can use a patient mannequin if you have one, you can use a pillow, you can use a stuffed animal, you can use whatever you want um, as a patient mannequin. You can even use, if you have a high fidelity mannequin, that's, you can also use that. Um, you need a monitor to stream the video. And that can be um, a laptop, it can be a projector, it can even be your phone, your mobile phone um, device. And then a, a huge advantage of this resource, I think, is that um, make it as, as, most, as realistic as possible. So if you wanna run this session at the back of an ambulance or if you wanna run it on the go, it's perfect because it's gonna make people use the equipment that they readily have with them. And that's a great way to identify gaps and, and, and equipment that, that you might um, think about getting with you next time you go. So in, in, my in our environment, it has really brought up many good discussions about um, sizing of, of um, equipment that we carry, that our, our EMS team here in New Haven carries with them. Um, and this is an issue that only comes up if you practice this session in your own environment with your own equipment. Um, this is how the room is usually set up. So you have some sort of mannequin and then you have you can use your if you have workstations or any laptop to stream this video that has the vital signs and the, and the patient video. Um, last year we we were lucky enough to be invited to Alaska and work with um, EMS agencies there um, and run this simulation. So here you can see um, I'm both a facilitator and a, and a, a participant and the parent so an embedded participant there's this baby I have um, I have my mouse here so that I can um, navigate the video that is streaming on this monitor. And here's my team, the team preparing for the arrival of the patient. Um, here the patient has arrived and the, um, they can easily, instead of asking me, oh, like what's the airway like? What's the breathing? What's the mental status of the patient? They can just hear this screaming, screaming child and have these answers and um, these questions answered immediately. Um, this is a little bit of a next level setting that we did last year, but um, here is um, his Harrison. He he's the master facilitator and he navigates the video. Um, 
the video is also being streamed on a monitor because there's there's a big audience here that's that's also listening in. Um, and then here's our team. You can see this like beautiful role delegation. There's there's a one a member of the team is is focused on my on this concerned parent, and the other members of the team are um, resuscitating this baby. So that's how we set up the rooms. The most common the most common setting is with with just a laptop or any device that you can put it here at the top of the bed and have people refer to for this video. Any questions about how the room is usually set up or like the practical side of things? All right. Um, so what is the what is the timeline and how does a session usually look like? And these are proposed times like you can you can run this same. You can take an, a whole hour to do this or you can take 10 to 15 minutes to run this session in your own place. Um, Lindsay, thank you. A recommendation regarding student to instructor ratio. Um, anything, anything that is practical and makes sense to you really like I would say that I would um, at least one to maybe two instructors and then students I wouldn't I would say so that they can they can all have a role at the bedside and participate maybe four or five participants active participants and then you can have more people observe um, and because there's really many things to be to be learned by just observing having a bird's eye view of how the, the simulation is running so I would say maybe one to two instructor, instructors, up to four or five participants, and then more people can observe. But I'm interested to hear what C Dr. Cicero um, has to recommend. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think that's a good ratio. One or two instructors, uh, four or five active participants, and um, there can be any number of um, of observers. This is a really nice fit for both BLS agencies and ALS agencies too. And in one of our BLS agencies that has a number of explorers and folks who are fairly early on in their um, EMS careers, uh, we'll have as many as uh, 10 or 15 uh, observers who tend to be uh, pretty early on in their careers. One additional thought is if there's only one instructor, if it's possible to recruit a patient or caregiver actor. And that could even be an ad hoc kind of thing where perhaps there's somebody who feels a little uncertain about being one of the uh, one of the participants in the simulation, one of the learners. We can still get them engaged and say, you know, you're really concerned about your baby and they've had a seizure and um, we want you to act really upset, but also provide this information. And it's a good way for somebody uh, to get involved uh, and become more comfortable with simulation. Thank you, Dr. Cicero. Thank you. Um, so that is that's a proposed timeline of how these um, these simulations or drills um, could run, and you can use as much time in each step as you want. But I think it's very important to start with a pre-brief. Then the videos have their own a pre-recorded dispatch and a two-minute countdown clock, during which time your team is getting their equipment ready talking through the case, signing roles, um, and then the actual simulation starts, which um, is the part of the video where you have the actual patient doing something, the monitor with the vital signs, and your team really on the mannequin acting and resuscitating the, the patient. Um, and then at the very end is a debrief. And myself, I get very excited about the simulation part of things, but the debrief is where the learning happens. Um, it's not there's some learning during the simulation, but debrief is where um, you um, consolidate what you've learned and you you look into why we do things the way we do or why maybe we should do things differently. Um, so the pre-brief is this kind of first two to three minutes where you introduce um, everyone to the simulation and um, all everybody develops their own spiel and their own their own um, script. But usually what I do is like, I welcome the team, I make some introductions if people don't know each other. And then I give everyone a, a, a general timeline so that they know like, is this gonna take 10 minutes or is this gonna take an hour and a half? So I give people a general timeline of what to expect. Um, it's very important to describe the actual 
um, the practical side of things. So say, you know, our simulator um, can move and breathe and, and talk back to you or say, you know what, our simulator doesn't do anything. If you listen for breath sounds, you're not gonna hear anything. Um, and also very important how to participate. So say, unless you verbalize it, I don't, don't assume it has happened. Um, or say, if you wanna get an AV, go through the actual steps of placing an IV or um, it, it's very very important to set the rule to set the ground rules about how um, how this is going to work and then the other ground rules that are very important to set um, is um, that first of all this is a safe space and you can decide how you want to phrase this but it's very important to say that this is a place where we should it's we should make mistakes and we should talk about the mistakes we make um, because these are all opportunities for improvement. This is not a blame. We're not here to blame anyone or scold anyone for not for things they don't know because um, the mannequin cannot be harmed. So make sure that everybody's on the same on the same mental model of this is a safe area for learning. And then ask people to kindly kind of play along and accept that obviously this is not realistic. Obviously, this is this is a plastic doll and not the real thing. But we'll have this fiction contract, and we, um, among ourselves, we make this pact that we're going to give it, like commit and give it everything we have. Um, in the booklet, and if this sounds quite overwhelming, because it did sound very overwhelming for myself um, when the first few times I did this, there's a I've re we've written everything down. So there's in the booklet, there's a page that has a scripted and narrated pre-brief that you can read. You can even read this before you start the scene. Um, you can make your own, your own adaptation of it. Or on the video, there's actually a fully pre-recorded, sorry, there's a pre-recorded um, pre-brief that if you want, you can have the video play and it's gonna do the whole work for you. So I'm gonna play a small part of this Sophia, this may just be me. I, I'm not hearing the. Uh, oh, you're the hearing audio. anything? Oh my goodness! Here I am <laughs> hearing the script and like saying it over and over in my head. I'm so sorry. So this is just to say, like, if you if you want to, like, you can have the video play and do the entire pre-briefing for you. You can read the script from um from the booklet. You can thank you for stopping me. Oh my goodness! Oh, you can. Uh, no worries. Uh, you can say your own thing. So, um. Yes, I'm sorry, Lindsay, I just saw the text. But anyway, that's the that's the pre-briefing part. And I'm interested to hear, Dr. Sister, your um your experience with pre-briefing and how do you what do you how do you usually start the sessions? Yeah. So uh one additional thing I like to say during the pre-brief is an assumption that we make. We assume that everybody who's in the room, you know, wants to do their best. That they've been trained, that they are acting as a professional, and that they're doing this in good faith. And that's part of the uh, contract that we make for safety. Um, you know, I, I also like to say that um, everyone in the room is going to make a mistake, including me as the facilitator. And that's great because, along the lines of what you said, Sophia, it's those mistakes that we make in simulation that help us learn and are the things that are most likely going to improve our performance in real life. Uh, but everything else I, I totally agree with. And one more thing about the barriers that we talked about at the beginning in that video that we saw uh, that Cynthia was showing us is what you see written here as a script and that can be read or the video that can be shown. These are all ways to help support a um, enthusiastic but relatively new to simulation instructor feel empowered to go ahead and lead the simulation during the pre-brief. And those are my only additional thoughts. Thank you. Great. Any thoughts? Any thoughts um, about the? Um, any thoughts from the audience about the pre-briefing or things that have worked or haven't worked in your experience?
or maybe even whether some of those barriers are relatable as far as your own experience as a SIM facilitator or what you hear from your educators. All right, I'll just gonna I'm gonna show you the few next parts, and I um I I I don't think I can have the the audio from the video playing on because I when I was making this presentation I I muted it so um so the next parts of the video are um let me just take you here so there's an there's an EMS dispatch so you're gonna hear probably myself um telling you um about the patient and then you have your two minute countdown clock um, during which time you prepare for the arrival of the patient. And then you have your, um, your patient video with the monitors. All right, and then we are gonna move to the debriefing part and I'll pass the baton to Dr. Cicero. Thank you so much. Um, debriefing, when I was a medical student or back, back when I was an EMT, um, had a different tone than it has now. Uh, at least during my training, debriefing, um, you know, was um, often had a negative connotation to it and a sense of um, people are going to be called out or be put on the spot about their performance. There are some ways to continue the sort of gentle spirit of learning that we did in the pre-brief that goes through the simulation and into the debriefing. And it's also been said, the whole reason we do the simulation is so we can do the debriefing because as Dr. Athanaspolo said, that's where the learning happens. So if someone is relatively new to facilitating a debriefing, it may be helpful to have a few tools in their pocket that they're familiar with that are part of Simbox and um, can be practiced. One is what you see on the screen here, this idea of the 3D. You know, after one of these simulations where we've just maybe had a critically ill infant, you saw the way that baby was breathing, that baby's septic, that baby's bordering between respiratory distress and respiratory failure. And the initial emotions of going through that simulation often need to be diffused. So the way a person can do that during the, the debriefing is to say, how did that feel? Or if that seems kind of too soft, you might say, you know, how do you feel about how that simulation went? Or how do you feel about how the team addressed that really sick patient? And then let the learners, um, you know, kind of go through and talk about how they felt. It's similar to doing a uh, history for a patient. And uh, we like to say the first minute belongs to the patient. If uh, somebody's not critically ill, we just let them talk. In the debriefing, we let them talk about the simulation. Next is discovery. Um, during the discovery phase, we're looking to um, understand what happened during the sim. I like to break things out in discovery by talking about maybe three different things. Talk about the healthcare medical management of the patient, talk about the teamwork aspect of things, and, and I think this is really important in pediatrics in particular, the communication with the family. So discover, you know, um, what happened during the simulation. Another tool that I like to add to 3D is this idea of action inquiry. You know, I like to ask open-ended questions and I also like to just make observations. I don't like to loop things out uh, or close things down too quickly and say, you know, you guys did a pretty good job, but I, it might've been better if you gave up an effort to that patient with anaphylaxis. Instead, I might ask it this way. This is the action inquiry. I noticed that uh, we were maybe 10 minutes into the simulation when the patient received epinephrine. How do you feel about that timeline? Is there anything you might have done differently? And then the patient or the participants can tell me, you know, it took us a little bit to recognize that patient had anaphylaxis. I would have given the patient epinephrine sooner if I were to do it over again. That's great. And then the deepen phase, we went from diffusing the emotions, the initial blush of how did that go? What do you think was going on with the patient? to um, the medical care, the teamwork aspect and the family uh, piece to deepening things. What can I generalize about my care for critically ill children with shock? 
what can I learn about postpartum hemorrhage? By the way, the postpartum hemorrhage one in a whole treasure chest might be the crown jewel because I know that a lot of our EMS uh, teams are particularly concerned about um, access to um, uh, labor and delivery services and more patients who have postpartum uh, issues. So I might ask in that sim, I might say, um, what will you do differently or what did you learn about the risks of postpartum hemorrhage or how to estimate how much bleeding uh, a, uh, a woman who's just given birth uh, has, has had? And then finally summarizing. I like to not be the last one to talk during a debriefing. I like to ask one of the participants to either summarize everything that we just talked about in a few lines, or maybe less um, difficult to do is just to say, what's one take home that you're gonna take from this simulation? So the 3D rule, maybe with a little bit of action inquiry, I noticed this, tell me about that, um, can be a really nice way to frame up the debriefing and to make it um, more learner focused and also uh, less intimidating, so. Uh, and other thoughts that you might have, uh, Dr. A, about uh, uh, about the debriefing and our approach in Simbox. I could not have said it better. Um, and to help people remember this again, this is a page from the booklet from the booklet that you're going to have, and it really takes you through these steps. Again, you can print this and have it with you to um, to guide this discussion. Another thing that I, I always like try to remind myself is like try to hold myself back and talk less myself as a facilitator in the debriefings, because really it's learning comes from, from the learners and, and, and the rest of the team. So like hold myself back. And the goal of the debrief is not myself to give a lecture on something, but it's to have people talk through their actions and why we do things um, and yeah. So that was the only other thing I had in mind. Um, and to empower all of you to lead a discussion in the debrief and talk about the medical management of, for example, a baby in shock, each booklet has um, resources that we've made for you to, to, to refer to. So for example, for this case that has a baby in shock, there's this mnemonic that I really like, the misfits talking about mm -hmm. different etiologies of shock, like heart disease, non accidental trauma, seizures, um, intestinal disasters. We also made this, again, one page of infographic that you can refer to. And we've, we usually also write things down in text about, um, about managing sick kids. So this is all, it's, it's a wealth of information that you can refer to um, and be empowered to talk about a septic neonate, for example. Um, Dr. Cicero. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm going to bring about our old friend, the pediatric assessment triangle, talk about its use in Simbox. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, Dr. Athanasa Polo, if you'd be so kind to check out uh, Lindsay Turnquest's question in the chat uh, regarding the source of some of our resources. So the pediatric assessment triangle is uh, a nice way to take doorway pediatrics and turn it into um, and turn it into something that we can teach to our learners and clinicians out in the field. It's a nice way to think about what we can do from across the room or without laying a stethoscope or a hand on the patient and get a sense for uh, whether they're sick or not sick. And um, I, I imagine for most, if not all of you, the pediatric assessment triangle is, is familiar. But by way of reminder, we take a look at the patient's work of breathing and whether they have visible signs of respiratory distress or sometimes audible, like grunting. Uh, we look at their circulation, their skin, their pallor, their, um, uh, their modeling or cyanosis of the skin, which can tell us a whole lot about their circulation and whether uh, that's compromised in thinking about uh, a patient who may be in shock. And we also take a look at their general appearance. What's their tone like? And this is, this is the piece that um, having some degree of familiarity with development for uh, babies and toddlers can be helpful, but just looking at um, their eye contact, whether they can be consoled, what their tone is like, are they floppy, are they rigid, are they having seizures, are they able to sit up and they're playing, um, and also are they able to speak 
if that's age appropriate or are they crying? And if they are crying, is it a strong, constant cry or is it a weak, whimpering cry? I remember being a brand new pediatrics resident and seeing a patient who uh, had an orthopedic injury and um, they were crying and crying and crying. And I was really concerned uh, that, uh, that they may have um, you know, uh, either some sort of neurologic issue or something along these lines. And my attending physician said, crying is music to our ears if it's strong. And we know that we can focus on the other issues that we see for the patient. So a nice thing about the pediatric assessment triangle too, is that depending on which sides are affected, the more sides we see affected, the more critically ill our patient is likely to be. If all three sides are affected, as you can see on the left side of the screen, the patient's in cardiopulmonary failure. Early shock or compensated shock may have some signs of circulatory issues, uh, but still a patient whose tone and work of breathing are, um, are not yet affected. And that worsens with worsening shock with their appearance um, and so forth. So a nice, quick, across the room way to assess a patient. We can move on to the next slide unless there are any questions about that. Um. I would like to answer a question. Um, it's uh, from from Bo, and he's he's asking how the cases are different. Um, so there's a main same box, which is um, the cases are more tailored for the emergency department and the um, and pa pediatric residents, EM residents, community hospitals, and then we adapted most of the cases, eight cases, to what would make sense and what would happen in the pre-hospital setting. So um, all of the resources and the steps in, in, in patient management for our EMS cases is really what, what we would, you would be able to do in the pre-hospital setting. So like we don't have an option to put a patient on, on BiPAP, for example, or um, administer antibiotics, or again, that depends from agency to agency, but all of the cases um, are, are written up so that it's things that realistically, hopefully realistically would happen in the pre-hospital setting. Um, and that really brings another, another point that I think is very important is that um, I very much admit my, my, my flow into like not having a lot of experience in, I've never worked as a paramedic or an EMS. So I've been making these cases with collaboration um, with people who are paramedics and EMTs and they are telling me, Sophia, what you put in that case doesn't make sense. We don't do that. So um, any feedback you have for these cases is very, 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 very well received and appreciated. Um, any way you can say, Sophia, like, a, for example, we need a case of um, croup. You don't have a case of croup. It would be super useful for us to have a, a case of a child with a child with strider, or um, this case, like we, this is not how it would happen in real life. Um, another feedback we've had is that our um, dispatches are not very realistic. So I'm working with a team to try and have um, them record dispatches that are more realistic. Um, to what to what you hear in everyday life. So, um, although we're trying to tailor all of this, and hopefully it's kind of, it's useful so far for the for the EMS um, setting and pre-hospital setting. Any feedback you have for how it can be even better, please let us know. It's very very um, it's a very easy process for us to update these cases and change things based on your feedback, and it's very appreciated. Um, and the last thing to say, and we mentioned this before, but this is. All of this comes from um, just again. This is we're not making any money out of this. This is not. Um, this is just something that myself and a group of other, uh, mostly PEM doctors and nurses and educators, um, are trying to create as a way to share the knowledge, knowing and recognizing that most of sick kids are being taken care of by community hospitals in the by pre-hospital providers, um, and. We, we know it's stressful and it's very hard and we just want to share and, um, and learn with you. So sorry about the rumble, but um, yeah, any questions? Any other questions you have? Sorry, a little distraction off, off camera. Um, I'll leave you to this, Dr. Athanasa Polo. But yeah. uh, I, I think the next message is really talk about this can be tailored to the needs of an agency or individual learners. Yeah. So 
some people like to use this as a 10 minute, uh, like a 10 minute on the go thing. So they just bring up the video and they just practice BVM um, at, their, at their bedside if they have some downtime. Um, it can be, it takes, it takes a little bit of more coordinating, but you can also run all virtual sessions or hybrid sessions. And lastly, this year we've been, we've been doing train the trainer sessions and we, um, with, with the help of an amazing nurse educator, and we've been doing these virtual sessions where we really show people how to use Simbox. And then um, if they want, we join a few of their first sessions that they run and kind of like sit at the back and, and offer any help as much as they need. But then after that, they're ready to have this to run this on their own. And this is really the goal is that there is, this is a, a free resource that you can use hopefully in a sustainable way um, and just practice, practice, practice in your own environment without needing, without having to, to coordinate with too many other people, too many specialists. Um, as I said, we really, I, we really appreciate your feedback. Anything you would like to see different or changed, let us know. And we're here and happy to help um, with anything that you want. Um, the only ask that we have um, is at, any, at the end of the, the session, if you want to fill out the survey, that's a way for you to communicate your feedback with us and say, that was absolute rubbish. Or <laughs> you can say, that was useful. Thank you very much. Or you can say, Sophia, make a, make a Strider respiratory distress case. Um, and this is just some data that we collected from, we've now been running this newborn resuscitation case um, with EMS, mostly here in Connecticut, but also in Colorado and Alaska. And we used these surveys to actually collect information about how our teams perform. Um, and we found out that, you know, many of our teams are actually doing chest compressions when the baby was born and was limp and floppy mm -hmm. and not breathing. Um, it was quite like quite often we didn't our, we didn't do the dry warm stimulate parts and there was a like there was some room for improvement um, with positive pressure ventilation. So um, this is also with Simbox it's it's an also a way to collect information about how our teams perform um, and have more data to you know advocate for more training or any other thing. And we're also open if you want to say. Um, Sophia, we want to run this case and collect data locally and publish this data ourselves. Like you can also, we're more than happy for you to do that um, in your own setting. So you can use this tool, you can use this as a kind of as a, as a way to measure care during simulations. Um, it's just some additional feedback um, that we've received about Simbox. Um, you know, Results may vary, but in a large group of EMS agencies, some of which have a pediatric champion or pediatric emergency care coordinator, others who don't yet, or you know that hasn't been a good fit for, for their model, we've been using Simbox. Again, Connecticut, Colorado, and then Rhode Island. And uh, some general feedback has included uh, from the very QR codes that you saw uh, that um, the majority, the vast majority, that you see here as far as knowledge, comfort with uh, the care of children who are low acuity and often high stakes or potentially high stakes patients. And that there's some improvement in teamwork as well in pediatric acute uh, care and uh, also improvement in psychomotor skills. You know, sometimes just getting out the pediatric equipment, placing a nasopharyngeal or a pharyngeal airway, doing good C and E bag valve mask ventilation, and, uh, and then perhaps some more uh, advanced skills like placing an IO, there are ways to incorporate that into Simbox, can really improve psychomotor skills. Um, one thing, knowing that we are in front of an audience of National Association of EMS Educators, and uh, also knowing that my filter is off because I worked last night, um, <laughs> you know, as I look at this and think about teamwork, communication, learning, psychomotor skills, and this sort of thing, if there is a team who's interested in Simbox for adult critical care in the pre-hospital setting. And if there is a need or a gap there, my goodness, that's maybe the uncharted country as far as uh, new directions. But we've been uh, really happy to share this with you and also uh, to share this with many learners. And um, those learners have provided good feedback, but more importantly, they've provided feedback that's helped us improve Simbox for children. 
uh, and we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, we're, we're working on an opioid overdose case and we call it a young adult. So it's like ah. a 20 something year old. <laughs> But yes, anybody who wants to be involved, let us know. Um, that's from the, the, the previous survey, like every the 100% of the participants said that it really helped their understanding of the neonatal resuscitation protocol algorithm and preparedness for delivery, teamwork, communication, second order skills. All right, um, so um, we're almost out of time. Um, hopefully during this session, after this session, you're now able to um, locate the resources needed to conduct the simulation during Simbox. You can describe the steps and process to conduct the simulation during Simbox, name the key elements of the pre-brief and debrief, and maybe if you're interested, you can try try it out in your in your environment within the next month. Um, this is a QR code. I don't know if it, if it will. I don't think it's going to work if you're already watching this through your mobile phone, but the website is called emergencysimbox.com. Um, you can scan this QR code to get this. And again, please reach out with anything you want to share. We're very happy to talk to you. All right. So I think that brings us to the conclusion of the webinar. So thank you both so, so much for the presentation. That was absolutely fantastic. And it seems like um, this is gonna be an amazing resource for everybody. So I will be sure to include the URL that Sophia shared in the follow-up email tomorrow, as well as Sophia's email um, for any other questions you may have. So with that, I'm going to conclude this um, webinar. So thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye.